What's going on, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Bronx Attorney Broadcast. Today's guest is Matt Halperin, and Matt Halperin is the the owner of Backstay Digital. And what Backstay Digital does is everything to do with websites. He can design your website. He can do SEO for you. Uh, you know, personally, he did a website for me. He does SEO for prior law. You know, I think he's great. And he is the youngest person, I think, so far to be on the podcast. He started this business from his dorm room. Um, he's got a lot to say. He, he knows so much about this area. And I hope you enjoy the episode. All right. How's it going, Matt? Thanks for coming on the show today and talking to me. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So tell us a little bit about your, about your background. Where did you grow up? Um, you just recently graduated from college. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so I'm from Westchester, New York, so a little bit uh, south of where you are in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And um, I, went to, I went to Union College and I went as an economics major. At that time, my goal was to become an investment banker or become a trader and work on Wall Street. Okay. So then I take it that it didn't go that way? Yeah. So my first internship, it was at a real estate investment trust. Okay. And I enjoyed it at that time. But I, you know, I noticed people around me, they really weren't that happy where they were. Okay. They were kind of clocking in, clocking out. And I never really thought much of it. Now, by sophomore year, so that's about two years ago, I ended up making a switch, switching from economics to political science. I just found that I enjoyed, I enjoyed writing a little bit more, and COVID hit. Right. So I was at home. I just finished my winter term of school. We were on a trimester calendar, so it was a fall, winter, spring, and I had uh, nothing to do. I was sitting at home, just kind of bored out of my mind. Mm -hmm. And I had found a good way to take up time was to start writing. So okay. I started writing content for other websites. Okay. Uh, for the purpose of it was SEO. So search engine optimization. I know you're very familiar with that. Uh, you're the big marketing guy, the, the <laughs> marketing guy. Exactly, yeah. so, um, so at that point, when you were doing this, were you working for somebody else or were you starting your own business or what, what I was doing? strictly doing this freelance. So I was doing this for you. I was doing it for prior law. Uh, I was doing it for my father and other small law firms that needed content on their website to help drive clients and uh, pick up leads. Okay. So for somebody who might know nothing about SEO, they have a business and they go on and they make a little website and it has the name of their business and the address and their photo and that's it, right? For someone like that, what is SEO? How does that help your business? So I think the best example for SEO is when you get a parking ticket or a speeding ticket. The okay. first thing you do when you get a speeding ticket, say you're doing 82 and a 50, you're gonna look up how many points am I facing when I'm doing 32 miles over the limits? Mm -hmm. I'd say most people look that up. Okay. And if you notice when you look it up, the first five or 10 websites are all traffic attorneys. Mm -hmm. And that is what SEO is. What they do is they write content on their websites, uh, either through blogs or through landing pages. And their goal is to capture website traffic for people looking up keywords related to what their practice areas are. So in their case, they're looking for speeding tickets clients. And then their hopes is that their information on the website will be helpful and then they can convert that person into, into a client. Exactly. So they want you to engage with their website. They want you to look through their contents, maybe get a little nervous, think you're going to lose your, uh, lose your case. If you don't hire them. Exactly. Yeah. They a lot of call to action. So if you, know, if you or a loved one have been uh, speeding or been ticketed for a speeding ticket in New York, call you know, so-and-so. Mm -hmm. So that's really what SEO is. And that's where I started. I was strictly writing the content for other web designers and developers. And it kind of gave me a little bit of freedom. I made a little extra money. Mm -hmm. And I kind of coasted until I'd say the winter. And that's when I really decided that I wanted to take my business to the next level and start expanding my service areas. So when you first got started, did you, did you form an entity to do this under? Did you have somebody that was helping you with it? Or was it just you under your own, your own name? I was really lucky in that my father was a lawyer and he was very prudent in that, you know, he told me the first thing you need to do is you need to make an LLC. Okay. If you get sued, it'll go through your LLC. Your assets won't be at risk. Okay. So he was very, uh, very helpful in guiding me through that. Mm -hmm. 
but I'd say I really started the business out of necessity, um, or I guess expanded it out of necessity because I come back, this is about March of 2021. I come back from a trip with my friends and I had no money. Okay. And I was frantically Try looking for some money together. Exactly. Enjoy yourself at college. I was fr exactly. I was frantically looking uh, to put together some money, get money together so I can enjoy the rest of my year. Uh -huh. And I looked to see where the real business was or you know, where people were really making money in the digital marketing and web design area. Mm -hmm. And I had realized that it's in the web design. The guys that make the websites, you know, they make the money. So I kind of emulated their style or their business model in a sense, mm -hmm. but tried to make it my own at the same time. Okay. So I had done my first website right when I got back. I cold called, found clients. I think actually... You might have referred me my first clients. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, my first website clients. They got referrals. So. Yeah, <laughs> and so you start doing this. Did, did you eventually? When you started, was there somebody helping you with it, or it was just you? Or when did you start to look to others to help you? It was just me. I figured that every dollar that the that I'm having uh, that I'm making, mm -hmm. I should keep in the company or I should reinvest. So I didn't hire anyone else. I kind of just put the money towards expanding my capabilities, learning what web design is, how to design a website. You know, uh, for those of you who don't, don't know a website, it's I guess CSS and HTML are the two main languages to design the front end. You know, to make it customizable, make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is with WordPress. And is that something that you taught yourself or you had classes on? Exactly. So I taught myself on YouTube and I had taken other courses. So I took the rest of my money that I had at the time, I think it was around $1,500. Mm -hmm. And I spent all of it on to starting the business and learning how to do this. Okay. And then so when did you start to, you know, how, how did that beginning start? Did you pick up a lot of clients right away? Was it slow and steady working on the same couple websites? I'd say it was slow and steady. I made the big mistake of not spending half my time looking for clients and looking for business and instead just spending all of my time, you know, delivering uh, work to my clients. So whether it was a landing page or a website, I didn't really focus on my own business, which is a little bit ironic because I was a digital marketing business that wasn't doing digital marketing for themselves. Right. And so at this, you know, you said it was during COVID, your sophomore year, you found this way to make money. Is it did you always want to start a business during college or, you know, what, was it just you didn't know what you could get a job doing in the middle of COVID? I'd say it was more the latter. I think it was the uncertainty. Um, not a lot of people were hiring. If they were hiring, they were usually hiring people that were older than me because I was a sophomore going into junior year at that time. Right. They were hiring juniors going into senior year, you know, people that could work for them after. And there just wasn't that much of a market for people that were like me, young, and that wanted to work in an office setting. Mm -hmm. So I got, I guess I kind of made my own office. And was that jobs in general or was that more in this sort of website design and SEO space? So now that's the interesting part. I had never really considered the website design or digital marketing space mm -hmm. until I started doing it for myself. Because at that point, I was strictly set or dead set on just finance. I wanted to be an investment banker. I wanted to make a ton of money, mm -hmm. and that was how I was going to do it. Okay. But I learned at the time that entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurial route was the best way to make money if you don't want to work in finance mm -hmm. or in those other, I guess they call them high paying industries, okay. because you have the freedom to own your own business, do what you want, and hopefully enjoy doing it at the same time. All right. And then growing up, you know, I know you said you're looking at finance right before college, but growing up, did you have any sort of, you know, aspirations to be a business owner or was it where you dialed in on, on finance? I was really dialed in on finance, but looking back, I can kind of see how the, the puzzle kind of uh, fixed itself because uh, I was actually talking to this last night with my parents. I had sold duct tape wallets in middle school and I was always kind of hustling uh, when I was growing up. Yeah. And it's candy money. exactly get some money, go to CVS and get a Snickers bar. Gotcha. And looking back, I guess it was kind of meant to be in a way because I'd always enjoyed that hustle mentality. You know, what you make is what you keep, mm -hmm. not just clocking in, clocking out where you kind of can't take a, have an appreciation for your work. Gotcha. So now you're looking at going to law school, right? Yeah. And so that. How did, how did law school come into the fold and, and how does your current business, how does that, you know, 
work with law? So I never thought about this until recently, but the idea of me doing the uh, digital marketing and SEO specifically at first, at least specifically for law firms, mm -hmm. the idea behind that was that I can go to law school, become an attorney, a plaintiff's attorney like you, oh, yeah. and being able to bring in clients through a website would be an asset to myself because I'd be able to bring in my own clients and hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. So you're going to use your experience in website design and SEO to eventually, do you want to own your own law firm? I hope so. That, that's exactly what I want. I wouldn't be an entrepreneur if I didn't own my own law firm. Okay, so you're going to use your experience to kind of get yourself yeah. the clientele that you need. I hope so. So tell me a little bit about where your business is at now. Uh, you know, how many clients do you have? Do you, you know, what, what locations do you have clients in or where do you work? So we have two offices now. We have one based in Westchester where it started. And then our new office is on Madison Avenue, okay. uh, 48th and Madison. And I guess we st when we first started doing websites, we were doing maybe one every two months. Okay. Uh, in July alone, we did eight websites, wow. which was great. It was the uh, most we've ever done. And that's actually what forced me to expand the business. I call it the lawyer's mentality, where you try to do everything on your own until yeah. you just physically can't handle the work. Right. And then you start hiring, starting with an associate, and then more and more and more. So... As of now, we have uh, two other employees, three total, one that specializes in web development and the other that specializes in digital marketing and SEO. Okay. And what's the name of your business again? Uh, Backstay Digital. So, I don't know if we said it at the top. So. It's, a, it's a weird name. So the uh, Backstay Digital, the Backstay is the part of a sailboat that holds up your mast. Okay. If you, lose, if you lose the Backstay, you, uh, you lose your mast, you drop it, and you're in a really bad situation. So in a way, it's kind of the most important part of the boat that no one ever talks about. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I wanted my web design and digital marketing company to be like. You know, it's something that you don't realize how integral it is until you don't have it or until you really need it. Gotcha. So um, the, what I say is good web design, you can tell. Great web design, you can never tell. I like to be invisible in the sense that you don't realize that we're there. But if you're in business, you know how important we are to helping you bring in clients and you know maintaining a nice professional digital presence. And that's what, what I really wanted and then that's what we're hoping to achieve over the next five to 10 years. Okay, and then, so what, when, I, when you're building a good website, what, what types of components to a website do you need? I always try to go for the visually pleasing, functional type of website. So. Uh, for example, a new thing I'm doing is on the front homepage of every website, I try to do montages. Okay. I'll show it to you um, a little later, maybe we can post it up, but the montage is essentially like a video slideshow that uh, it's become a new digital marketing trend in the last, I'd say, six to nine months. So I'm always trying to kind of come up with new concepts that will allow me to create new, exciting, and unique content for my clients. Okay. I'd say that's where that's where I am right now, and it's something that I think will help us grow in the next five to ten years. Essentially, finding out what's hip, what's new, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't exist, creating it for our clients. Because we always say we like to offer them, you know, full three hundred and sixty control over the website in terms of what they want, without them having to sit down at the computer and uh, tell me exactly what to do. And that's in the web design. That's in the design. web design. And I'd say that's actually the, the biggest trend in the next, I'd say the next five to 10 months is you're going to see a lot of websites with a front homepage. The top area is always a slideshow or a video. And what, like, what is it a slideshow of? Like what, the, what that business does and the people who work there? Uh, it could either be a slideshow of the business itself. So if you're a power washing company, it could be a slideshow of a ASMR type video where they're power washing graffiti off a wall. Gotcha. Um, I'm actually doing a website right now for a digital media company that specializes in drone videography. Mm, okay, so and that's a pretty easy one to get some exact, footage for. You know, you can't get bad footage on a drone, right. that's what I always say. Right, so when, when you want to be findable online, the number one place to go for that is Google, right? Yeah, because Google is, you know, no one says, I bing this the other day. No one uses bing. Google is the uh, bee's knees. It is what people use. It's what people search with. And it is the best way to get yourself in front of a big audience. So what, what, what do you have to do for a website so that it's, it 
it's it's climbing that ranks to becoming on the first three or five pages of Google. I'd say the most important thing you can do for your website is post every day, okay. or post at least you know once a week. And what what types of things should you be posting? So it depends on the industry. You know, if you're a website uh, designer, for example, like myself, I'll post on my website you know new content about digital marketing trends. You're a lawyer, so you got to post about stuff that's related to your practice areas. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, for example, last year, trip and fall accidents went up 10% mm -hmm. year over year. COVID could have played a role in it, but it's an interesting statistic nonetheless, and it's something that can help you get in front of people. And so that's through blog posts. Exactly. Doing this, and you, you will write content for people like attorneys who need this kind of exactly. words on a page type of thing to stay relevant. So we write, exactly. So we write, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 word blog posts. The blog posts kind of answer questions that you might have. So for example, you get hit by a car, you might want to know uh, what kind of damages you can collect, what kind of compensation. A good blog post or landing page will talk about the different types of compensation you may be entitled to, such as pain and suffering, wrongful death, loss of consortium, the kind of things that the courts pay out. So you really have to tailor your content to what your audience is looking for and what your demographic is looking for. So if you're a personal injury attorney in the Bronx, for example, you might be looking for someone uh, that's a construction worker because there's demographically there's a lot more construction workers in the Bronx than there would be in Larchmont, New York or Rye, New York right. because the business is in the Bronx and in Manhattan, that's where people live. So you might want to tailor your uh, blog post towards scaffolding accidents, trip and fall accidents related to construction work electrocution, stuff like that. Stuff that your demographic uh, or your target demographic would look up right. and would engage with. Because engagement rates are really what you're looking for. Because mm -hmm. the more the more people engage with your website, the more likely they are to retain your services or to buy your product. And that goes for any industry, uh, whether you're working in wealth management as a financial advisor, uh, you're working as an attorney, or if you're just trying to sell a product, uh, for example, a wee wee pad. <laughs> okay. And, and so when you say engage with you, is that you know, the time that's spent on, on the website itself or on the Exactly. Page? So we track everything on, your, on any website through Google Analytics. So okay. we like to see how people are getting to a website, whether it's through ads, if it's organic, if it's through social media. And then we like to see how long they spend on your website and how long they spend on each page. And that's a very good predictive indicator for whether or not they'll A, be back, and B, will retain your services. I'd say it's not as great for the latter. However, people that spend more than three to four minutes on a website generally come back to that website. And so you're, you're able to tell all of this information from what? From Google Analytics. So okay. uh, one of the employees I have, the digital marketing specialist, is very good with Google Analytics. He can track engagement rates. That's what he does. He's a data analytics person. So I'd say that's his, that's his area of expertise, but what I, can, what I can tell you is that we can pretty much track a person's general behavior on any website that we uh, operate. Okay. And that allows us to create better content, uh, target our ads a little bit better for using advertising as a model, and generally speaking, assess how well the website is doing. Okay. So how exactly do you change your approach if based on that information that you're finding in Google Analytics. I think you can touch on it a little bit, but. So for example, if we're, I say the best example I can give you is with the one wheel uh, campaign we recently finished. So the one wheel, uh, one wheels, as you know, they're these big one wheel skateboards and we're uh, creating content to raise awareness for their defects. Right. Okay. And uh, we were doing this for an attorney. Mm -hmm. So we found that the, at first, we started advertising strictly in New York City and Manhattan uh, and the outer boroughs, so strictly in that area. But what we had failed to realize in the first month was that these boards cost twelve, thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars, and they go twenty miles an hour. They might not want to. People might not want to ride these boards in condensed cities where they can take subways, where they they may not want to walk around with a twenty pound board. Okay. So what we did was we changed the, or we did an IBM, I call it. We completely pivoted and we went towards suburban areas where people are more likely to be on a skateboard or a bike for more than one mile. Okay. 
and kind of understanding our demographic and who we're looking for. Essentially, for one wheel, I guess it would be their client or their uh, customer. For us, our client mm -hmm. allowed us to better place our ads, save money, and uh, more importantly, get cases. Uh, or we call them viable leads, uh, potential leads. And just essentially just changing our demographic where we advertise to was the most effective way. And that was done. That was best done through Google Analytics because uh, Google Analytics essentially told us that people don't engage with our posts. They don't like to see these one wheel ads or these uh, one wheel accident attorney ads. So what we did was we scrapped the project. We uh, from the bottom up ran a whole new advertising campaign and it's been wildly successful since. Okay. And so before we get to, to talk a little bit more about ads, you know, why should somebody pay you to create content for their website? Because everybody in the back of their head is like, I know this better than everybody, anybody else, right? I should just write the content for my own website. Well, I would say when you work with a digital agency or a creative agency, we generally understand people pretty well. So you might understand your demographic and you know your ideal customer, your ideal clients, but we can do it just as well and we can work essentially in the background where you can focus on your business. Okay. I think that's a big thing about you know, focusing on your business. Exactly. Because <laughs> uh, my biggest problem was, like I said before, I was a digital marketing agency that wasn't doing any digital marketing for themselves because I was too busy doing it for other people. When you operate a business, your co customer or your clients generally come first and you're working long hours often. If you're an entrepreneur... A lot of the time, you're not working a normal nine to five. You're working to finish the work that's put in front of you, yeah. and that could be you know eight a.m. to twelve a.m. or it could be two or three hours a day. It really depends. But when you're focused on your business, you should really be focusing strictly on getting the work done and delivering good quality products or services, not just finding clients, mm -hmm. because though that really impedes. You can't do two things at once. You can't be a digital marketer. You can't be a lawyer. Well, maybe you can. <laughs> But um, for most businesses, it just doesn't make sense the way they, to allocate your time split between two very important things when you could be you know, perfecting your product or service and letting an agency deliver you clients and potential leads. Okay. And then, so you're talking about ads. Do, do you help people with ad campaigns as well for their, for their business? Yeah, that's a big part of what we do too. Uh, PPC ads, we call it pay-per-click. Mm -hmm as well as social media ads. Uh, those allow us to get in front of a bigger audience, you know, get in front of 30 to 300,000 people. Uh, but at the same time, we like to post at the same uh, rate, you know, three to five times a month at the very least. Okay. And what that allows us to do is essentially create organic content and promote the page at the same time. Think of it uh, like the TikTok effect. You know, you see, uh, you see something that's in front of you and ad you click on the page mm -hmm. and sometimes you th scroll through 5, 10, 15 other videos and you engage with it. Yeah. And that's only possible because they're posting this content regularly online. And Facebook or Meta will even tell you it's not even worth advertising your services if you're not posting consistently every month or every week. Okay, so you want to hook somebody with one post and then have them click exactly. on the website looking at everything else. Exactly. So think of the... Uh, if for as a fishing metaphor, think of the ad as a hook that's a hundred yards out from your uh, from the dock, mm -hmm. or think of think of the ads as chum, mm -hmm. rather. Uh, if you're doing the fishing method, your ads are chum, and you have hooks right around the boat that allowing allows whales and sharks to come in. So that's really what it is. Your, exactly. Your Con sale or your fish. Convert our traffic into leads, our leads into clients or customers, and the customers and clients into your bottom line. Okay. And this might sound like a stupid question, but what, what is pay-per-click? So pay-per-click are the types of ads on Google and on Facebook or Instagram on social media where they charge you for every time someone clicks on your website, for every engagement. So there are two types of ways of measuring ad traffic or measuring traffic to a website. There are engagements, which are people interacting. For example, on Facebook or Google, that'll be a click that redirects you to your website. And there are impressions or views, mm -hmm. uh, no different from a YouTube view. It's just whether or not someone scrolled through. Okay. And there are a lot of different ways to track engagement, but with PPC or pay-per-click ads, it strictly comes down to how often they click on the, the advertisement link to get to your website. And in some 
practice areas or some industries, that's great. You know, um, uh, if you're a contractor in some areas, that could be a great way to bring in business or a lawyer. But in mo- more cases than not, I say most of the time, uh, pay-per-click ads become pretty expensive, mm-hmm. which is why we choose uh, SEO. Gotcha. So if you're selling you know, a product or a service that's worth a lot of money, pay-per-click could be more beneficial because of how expensive it is. Exactly. So uh, one click on a construction accident advertisement on Google, if you look up construction attorney, that'll cost between 35 on the very low end, Mm -hmm. but more likely closer to $350 per click Mm -hmm. just for one click. And that doesn't even ensure you will receive a client out of it. Mm -hmm. So we choose SEO because it's a little slower, but it's an organic way of bringing people to your website. And sometimes we actually do SEO and PPC at the same time, which is the same thing that we do on social media where we advertise and add content. Mm -hmm. It essentially allows us to get engagements with our content and help push it higher on Google. And and there's a lot you can do with the social media advertisements as well in terms of looking at your audience, right? Yeah, absolutely. If you have a business account uh, with Instagram, TikTok, or Facebook, you have access to all their analytics and I guess from a normal person standpoint that's not really immersed in this digital marketing area, it's a little overwhelming mm-hmm. because you don't realize how much data they collect from you. Right. So so how how specifically can you pinpoint, you know, your target customer that is the ideal customer for, you know, your client's business? So some of it comes down to rationalizing, understanding consumer behavior. And I'd say our company is pretty good at that. We can understand who our target demographic, our target audience is, and tailor our content to that demographic, to that audience. However, with the power of uh, the meta data that they offer us, or meta being Facebook, Instagram, we can actually see you know, exactly how long people are spending on our posts, how well they're engaging. And they won't give you the actual timer, but every time you scroll through an Instagram post, a timer starts off. So you scroll to my post, Mm -hmm. one, two, three, four, you scroll down and the timer resets. And they have a very good understanding of how people are Mm -hmm. engaging with your content. They don't necessarily give you those tools or the raw data. However, they do have a very robust platform that allows us to better understand our engagement and our our audience because no one's engaging with your post. What's the point of posting at that point? This episode of the Bronx Attorney Broadcast was brought to you by me, Will Ferrero. Uh, I'm an attorney in prior law right here in the Bronx, and we primarily practice in personal injury. However, we do also do a, a variety of areas of practice. So I can help you with just about any sort of legal issue that you might have. I'm admitted to practice both in New York and New Jersey. And if it's not something that I can personally help you with, I can connect you with someone in my network of attorneys who is best equipped to help you with your legal issue. You can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Bronx Attorney. You can send me an email, Ferrero at Prior Law, or call me at the office, 718-829-0222. And now back to the show. All right. And back to Google, you know, Google searches. How important is it to have a Google My Business account and to be collecting reviews because that, that could be really tedious. That is, to... that is critical. Okay. Uh, so there are two types of SEO. There is on one side, there's local SEO and then there's national level SEO. Mm-hmm. National level SEO, very easy. Think of it as, you know, you look up one real attorney, construction attorney, and what pops up on Google on the first page, that's national, SEO, national level SEO, I call it. Local SEO is also equally as important, especially if you're tailoring your services to a certain area or industry. Mm -hmm. So for example, Bronx attorney, uh, local SEO is critical because if someone looks up attorney near me or attorney in the Bronx, all the Google businesses show up and the way Google ranks them is not random. It's ranked often based off the reviews, based off how how many people engage with them. So having a lot of reviews on your Google page is very, very important. Mm -hmm. And also setting up your Google business page in a way that you can, you list out your services. So those keywords are uh, indexed with Google Mm -hmm. is very important because if someone looks up, maybe contract attorney near me, you might not show up if you don't offer that as a practice area with Google. Got it. And that's actually in Google's 
the way you set up your business account. Exactly. That's in Google business specifically. So when you set it up, they'll give you all these questionnaires. And a lot of the time people just skip them over, mm -hmm. but that is a big mistake if yeah, you I do. I go back in and look at mine now. That's I took care of you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it sounds like you, you need all of these things to be, to be taken care of, to really have a, you know, have your advertising and SEO to be successful, right? Yeah, I would say it's like a Rubik's Cube in that you need every side to be perfect or to align nicely. It's going to be very hard to get clients these days as a lawyer if you don't have a website, but you have a very good Google business page or yeah. vice versa. So you need to have kind of every side of the, uh, I guess, of the Rubik's Cube there. I guess it's on the very, the best analogy, but that's all I can come up with. So, I mean... It seems like now there's so many businesses that are offering what you're offering, right? I get emails that have since been filtered out of my email, you know, for, for a ton of them. So why should people hire you to take care of this for them? I'd say we're results driven in that, uh, I say several different reasons. The first one, we're results driven in that we don't charge an exorbitant amount of money until we start delivering you clients. Okay. But the biggest, uh, I guess, distinction with my company is that we have real people that are good at writing, doing our content. And that's at the basic level. Um, a lot of the reason I got into this industry was I noticed that a lot of the content writers, a lot of the copywriters just weren't producing good content. The attorneys were spending an hour, hour and a half making red lines and then delivering it back to the copywriter or the copy editor. And it just wasn't uh, efficient for them. And so is that because they're writing with poor grammar? Or they yeah. Don't, they don't know the subject exactly. matter or both? So it's a little bit of both. They don't know the subject matter. They have poor grammar. And also they don't know how to implement their keywords in. So they don't know how to add uh, the main keywords, the primary keywords. We call them in the secondary keywords. A primary keyboard, a keyword could be you know, Bronx, New York employment attorney. And the secondary keyword could be wage theft. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to embed those keywords into your article or I should say implement them rather because if you don't then there's no point in posting it because you're not going to target any specific uh, search queries so that's one thing that really sets us apart and i think another thing that sets us apart is our i guess the the quality of our services mm -hmm. we tend to deliver uh at least i like to think we deliver pretty good websites okay. and we, we tend to be pretty responsive yeah um, so I, I think that's a big, that's a big distinction between us and a lot of other companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I like our websites that you made for us, so that, that can thank you. for that. <laughs> thank you. So I'd, I'd hope that that's a, a big distinction. You know who you're dealing with. Uh, a lot of the time we, we deal with referrals, so a lot of the time people can see what we've already done. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, people like our websites. We give them full creative control of the website if they would like it. If they're not really sure what they what they want, we always deliver mock-ups and we give them, you know, kind of an option, or multiple options to choose what they like. Mm -hmm. And we don't use templates and we pride ourselves on that. Okay. We don't like to use themes or templates if we can help it. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to make our own theme files if you're looking it's for... A template is something that you go online and you download it and then exactly. you fill in the blanks, right? Exactly. So we don't like to do that if we can help it because... That doesn't help with the SEO. That really uh, impedes it. And that's one thing that also is a distinction and really sets us apart. When you're dealing with a lawyer's website, that's a WordPress uh, you know, theme, for example. 50, 500 other uh, lawyers could be using that. And a lot of the content, people just don't change. You know, We will fight for you could be used across 5,000 websites. So using the, having a bottom-up uh, creative agency like us allows you to have full creative control and have a website that's unique and SEO friendly. And that's a big distinction. And sometimes it's a little bit more expensive, but at the end of the day, you wanna have something that's yours and you like. It's like buying a watch, I say. You have to love it and it has to be you know, useful for you. Mm -hmm. And I think we deliver, a web, we, for all of our clients, I think we deliver both of those. I think we deliver websites that are SEO friendly, that allow our clients to bring in business and help them in the long term. And they're visually pleasing. We have a good, you know, user experience. Use, we have great designs. At least I think we have great designs. I always say that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's what sets us apart. And that's what I pitch to my clients. Okay. You ever deal with apprehensive clients because of how young you are? As, you know, you were doing this in college. 
So I wouldn't say I deal with apprehensive clients based off my age. I think clients tend to be, uh, they tend to be unsure because based off their age. I've noticed that selling a website to someone that's in their 40s is a lot easier than selling a website to someone that's you know, 60, 65. Just because when you're in your 40s, you tend, you, generally speaking, you've grown up with this technology. You understand, you were through the dot-com uh, era where you understand how important a website could be versus you know someone that's older has been in business for quite a long time they deal uh, often they deal based off their or they get clients based off their reputation or based off referrals and i'd say that's the biggest um that's the that's the biggest i guess trend that i've noticed gotcha i always like to ask people about that because you know every once in a while a potential client's eyes will bug out of their head when they realize that i'm their attorney and not some uh, <laughs> six year old guy with a big white beard um, so tell me a little bit about links. We've talked about links in the past, right? How you're supposed to, how to do, you know, good SEO. You want to be linking throughout your website and you want other people to be linking to your website too, right? Yeah. So, uh, outbound and inbound links on your website and you want to have outbound links on other people's website. Okay. So, uh, link building is quite important. So uh, what's outbound and inbound? Links? So when we do a page, you'll notice that and pretty much any website, uh, you'll notice that, oh, let's just start with an attorney. There are links on the page that take you to your practice areas that could take you to a contact page. These links essentially that are in that are internal links, uh, these inbound links, they essentially, or I should say there's internal links and external links and inbound links and outbound links. Internal links are within your website, so they take you to your contact page, they take you to your practice area page, and that kind of guides the flow of traffic. So mm-hmm. think of it as... So that's a link on my page that links elsewhere exactly. on my website. It's like a current in the water. It pushes your traffic into this area or into another area. Mm-hmm. Outbound links are really just good for SEO in general. Uh, it's really difficult to describe, I guess, how, how good an, an external link, how, how it really helps your website. Now, having links on other people's websites or to other people's websites are very, very important Mm -hmm. because that allows people to get to another traffic source. It allows people to get from one website to another instead of looking up or uh, Googling or going on social media to get there. It's Mm -hmm. a new way of, uh, you know, bringing people in. That that also gives your website credibility with Google, right? When you're on other people's websites. Exactly. So Google loves that. You know, if you have no if you have no links on other people's websites, it won't necessarily ruin your SEO. It won't make it or break it. However, if you're in that middle ground, I call it the the, the middle page problem where you're not on the last page, you're not on the first page, but you're on like the fifth or sixth page. Yeah. Having these links could really push you higher. Okay. And I'd say that adds a level of credibility to Google, having external links on your website, for example, to like a statistic point, a data point, mm-hmm. also adds a layer of legitimacy for your own content. When you're linking to something else. Exactly. Okay. And I've heard that Google changes its algorithm kind of frequently about how it you know, values websites. How do you deal with the kind of moving target? Of that? I love that. Um, I think that it's in a way kind of evens a playing field because uh-huh. if Google had never changed their uh, algorithm the way they rank websites, the guys I got in there early would just be there for life. It'd be like Manhattan real estate. Gotcha. This kind of levels a playing field in a sense that it gives you the opportunity to get to the first page. Mm-hmm. So whoever's staying on top of their game is the one that's rising to the top. Exactly. So, the, uh, for example, since we're still on the lawyer's subject, if you're doing a product's liability case and yeah. your keywords involve other products, mm-hmm. uh, exact tech, um, their hips and knees, one of the two, yeah. they just recently had a recall in February of 2022. And the problem with advertising or putting SEO up is that exact tech, technically, they have a lot of, they have a lot of SEO. They have pretty much the first page entirely with their products uh, for any keyword related to their knee or hip uh, or total hip systems, total knee systems. So having a changing algorithm, you know, having Google adjusted every you know month or year allows you to get to that first page a little easier because you're not just competing against them. It's gotcha. more of the way you go about it. Okay. 
What would you say the the biggest difficulties of owning your own business is? Oof. I'd say the 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 biggest problem with it is you got to wear a lot of different hats. Mm-hmm. You have to some days you have to be the accountant. You have to run your own books. Other days you're the salesman. You're looking for clients. Maybe you're cold calling. Uh-huh. And I've noticed that wearing all these different hats can be convoluting and can kind of take away from my. Or, pull my focus away from where it should be on the business, you know, churning out websites, creating content and interacting with clients. And the operations really uh, convolute things. They make it difficult to, to achieve your goals. So that's actually why I ended up hiring more people. I told you the lawyer's method. I worked until there was physically too much work for me to handle. And uh, pushing that aside has allowed me to work more on the operations and building the company. And I'd say that's the biggest uh, impediment that I've noticed in running your own business. Yeah, my next question was going to be how do you deal with that, but you already answered that, so that's good. What would you say to somebody who is sitting in their dorm room thinking about starting a business, um, but is feeling apprehensive about it, or that they they feel like they're too, you know, inexperienced or too young to I was, really get started? I was actually just talking to my friend about that. I'd say just do it. I would rather be the person that tried and failed than the person that never tried. Because you try and fail, it could hurt, it could put you down a little bit, but at least you tried. At least you did something that no one else has done, or at least you know, most people haven't done. Yeah. Exactly. Not that many people, everyone says you know, America is the land of small businesses. Not that many people I know run their own small business. Sure. So just trying, you know, putting yourself out there, I think is really valuable and you can learn from your mistakes. Mm-hmm. So how do you, how do, what's the first step you, would, you think you should take? What was the first thing you did towards, you know, uh, approaching a new business? So I guess before you even consider starting a new business, I'd say the first step is find a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'd say most businesses, most great businesses, they start with a problem. And they start with a niche. Right. So I'd say find your problem, find your niche. Mm-hmm. So a big problem, I guess, in my industry, in the digital marketing, is not not a lot of people have websites these yeah. days. A lot of these small businesses have been founded you know, way before websites were even uh, a concept. Mm-hmm. And they just never thought to start one. So I found the problem and found my niche. And why, why do you think that is? I think people started and didn't have a website, so they thought they just never needed one? You know, it's a if it ain't broke, don't fix it. A lot of people tend to get their clients or customers from referrals or from, uh, I guess, their reputation in the community, mm-hmm. and they tend to stick with that. Um, whereas younger people, you know, someone who's just started a business, whether it's website related or not, they understand the power uh, that a website can bring. You know, they can they can bring clients in. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't even have you know Google businesses because they don't think it's worth their time. Got it. That's something that's relatively easy to do. Very, um, 10 minutes, I'd say. Very easy. So what do you think was is the most, you know, in the past few years of owning a business, well, what's been the most rewarding thing or what's, what do you think has been your greatest accomplishment so far? Um, I guess generally speaking, rewarding is seeing the finished project, uh, the finished project or the finished product. Mm-hmm. So I've always had trouble finishing projects or products when I was young. Right. Uh, I'd start something, I'd have the, uh, really immersed in it, and then I just wouldn't want to finish it. So nowadays, I really take pride in finishing a website. Gotcha. Um, going forward, I think uh, we're moving more towards website development and app development. Okay. So that's really been my, my baby these last few weeks and months. So my hope is that uh, by the end of the summer, or at least by the end of September, that my next project will be finished, which will be a uh, financial literacy app. Okay. And what is what is the financial literacy app going to do? But what's its use going to be? It's going to solve a problem. So the big problem was we've noticed that um, my my uh, colleagues and I noticed that a lot of people just don't understand simple concepts such as compound interest or the value of you know putting away $500 a month to max out your Roth IRA. Okay. And our goal is to deliver a app that works kind of like a course where people can learn at their own pace how to invest and how to become financially sound and independent. And I'd never really thought about this until recently. Uh, it actually came from my siblings because they, 
are pretty savvy. They're uh, they work. They know how to uh, you know use a computer. They understand the stock market to an extent, but they never got out and made an account, made a brokerage account. So my goal is to essentially deliver an app that can help the normal person, the common person, learn how to invest and how to you know push their future, how to I guess ensure their future. Okay, and so when do you think that's uh, when do you think that's going to be? Uh, <laughs> that's good. The data coming out. That's going to be. I'm. We're thinking six to nine months. Okay. So hopefully, not, not as long as I would have thought. Uh, we've no. You know, website can take four to six weeks. Yeah. Uh, an app is a lot longer, and that's actually something that we didn't realize because we, well, what we did and what I did from the very beginning was I'd always say I'll learn how to do it on the fly. Mm-hmm. You know, if I'm making a website. My first website, I didn't know how to make a website. I just did it on the fly. I learned how to YouTube open on one tab, learning how to do it, and I had the website. I had WordPress open on the other tab. So there's a little bit of a learning curve, and I t- we tend to learn as we do it. With the app, it's a little bit different because I'm the one doing the learning. We have uh, app developers, a web developer, and he he's the one that's in charge of it. But I tend to learn as I go, and... What I thought could be four to six weeks as a normal website turned out to be, you know, six months plus. And so is app development something that you offer clients through your business or is that something that you're just doing yourself? Uh, so this this particular project we're doing ourselves. Uh, the reason why we're doing this ourselves is because we want a something to show our clients. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to sell a website to someone or sell an app if you've never done it before. Right. You know, no one wants to be here first. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're doing this to kind of get experience doing it. The website, we never did that. And that was a, I'd say a mistake because we were learning on the fly and we did make a lot of mistakes on the way. Mm -hmm. Doing an app, we don't want to make those same mistakes. So we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, but in the future we will be offering, uh, website developments or think web applications and app development services to clients. Okay. Uh, whether they want an app for their own business or if they're raising money for a startup, we will provide those services. And that's where, we, that's where we're really looking to move in the next five to 10 years. Okay. What else do you see on the horizon in the next five to 10 years for you? Uh, in terms of the digital marketing and design, I think we're actually going to move away from the digital marketing and more towards the, you know, creating websites and creating apps you know, real tangible things that uh, that can really develop, uh, you know, really push us into the next decade. You know, there's a tend to be a lot of, as you mentioned, you get a lot of solicitations for digital marketing. You don't get as many for web development and for app development. The market just isn't as saturated. Mm-hmm. So that's where we're really trying to push. We think it's a growing industry. It's, you know, there's a, a lot of demand for it. So uh, our hope is to really find or move into that niche. And move away from uh, from things that we started off with, things that seem a little bit more comfortable. All right, cool. And so, if somebody wants to get in contact with you to, you know, uh, inquire about your services, how can they find you? Uh, so they can find me at backstaydigital.com. Uh, you can always email me. My name is Matt, and my email is matt at backstaydigital.com. We try to make it easy. Yeah, you looked right into the camera for the sell there at the end. So the call to action. <laughs> All right, Matt. Thanks for uh, chatting with me today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bronx Attorney Broadcast. Please like, review, and subscribe so we can help the channel continue to grow. And if you're interested in connecting with any of the guests, please let me know, and I'd be happy to make the introduction.